Hey everyone, thanks for joining Learn to Play Games. My name is Lance, and in today's video I'm going to teach you how to play Shovel Knight Dungeon Duels. This is a brand new game from Panacall Games. It is a 1-4 to four player game that takes roughly 45 minutes to an hour and a half to play. It is a competitive game where players are going to be moving through a side-scrolling adventure, trying to defeat enemies and possibly pushing fellow knights into obstacles, all in the hopes of collecting coins. Once they reach the end of the stage, they'll move off and face off against whichever boss was selected for this particular mission. Once the boss is defeated or timed out, the players will total up all of their coins and any heirlooms that they have, and the player that has the most coins at the end will be the winner and the new champion with all the bragging rights that come with it. Now, a couple important things with this video. First off, this is 100% fully approved by Panacult Games, so all the rules that are represented in this video are completely accurate, as the rulebook has been reworked just to make sure that everything's clear and some of the things have been adjusted a little bit. So some of the things might not be exactly the same as the rulebook, but everything in here, all the rules that are presented in this video are 100% accurate and will reflect the new rulebook when it is re released on PDF on Panacult's website later on, close to the release of this video. Now, other than that, in the video, I'm going to teach you how to play, starting with components, setup, player turns, and end game conditions. I'll break it off into going through the stage first, and then I'll cover the boss battle at the end. Now, I'm also going to be making a second video covering each one of the bosses in their stages, as each boss has their own special set of stage tiles that has some different rules and different adjustments. So I'm gonna cover a separate video of that so this one isn't super long. And then I'll also cover the expansion that you can pick up as well for the wandering travelers. So I'll have that video coming out later. But as always, if you find these videos helpful, if you like what I do, please consider that like button, subscribe to my channel. It's one of the easiest ways you can support channels like mine so we can continue to grow and be able to produce this content. If you want to stay tuned in all the videos as I release them, also considering that bell so you get notifications anytime I release new stuff. So let's head to the table and I'll teach you how to play. First, let's start by looking at the custom set of six sided dice included in the game. There are three different icons you're going to find on these dice. Each icon is going to represent one success in its area. So we'll have shovels, which are going to count as one success for combat. The arrows, which are going to count for one success when jumping, and armor, which is going to count as one success when performing an armor or defensive roll. Each die is going to have six different sides on it, including a side with a shovel, a shovel and a jump, two shovels, two armor, an armor and a jump, and two jumps. And I'll go over more of this later in the video. There are three different types of cards that players are going to be interacting with throughout the game. The first type I want to cover are loot cards, and these are going to be broken down into four different decks. Relic, Curio, Arcana, and Heirloom. Each card within each deck can be used in one of two different ways. Each card on the back of the card is going to have an ability, and this ability is going to be the same for every card of that deck. So all Relic cards will have the ability that you can discard that card to gain plus two successes on the next dice roll. And each one of the different loot card decks is going to have a different ability. So with the Curio cards, all of them can be discarded to force a rival player to re-roll all of their last dice roll. On the front side of each card is going to be an item or a, a different ability. Each item is going to list the name of the item at the top, along with an image of that item and some flavor text. Underneath that in the second box is going to be the way that item works. Most items are going to list if they are an attack, what type of attack it is, and the number of dice you're going to roll. And then any other abilities. So with the Dust Knuckles, this one lets you fly two spaces, and then you can hit all enemies in that path. All heroes in that path are also going to be pushed, and you may move through walls with this particular ability. And each time you use a card, you can only use it for either its front side or its back side. So if you use the front side, and discard it, you will not be able to trigger the backside ability of that card. The second type of cards are spawn cards. Each time you reveal a new tile that shows the spawn symbols or the bone clank skull in the bottom corner, you will have to draw and resolve a spawn card. You're always going to start at the top of each tile and work your way down each space, revealing a new spawn card. So for example, with this one here, let's go ahead and say we flip over this card. So we'll add a bone clank and a wisdom to that card. Next, we would handle this space, and let's say we flip over this one, so we'll have a propeller rat in that space. And the final type of card are equipment cards. The equipment deck is comprised of four different types of cards, accessory, powder, armor, and cloak. 
Each equipment card is going to list the name of that equipment at the top, along with its image, the type of equipment it is, and the ability or effect it grants the knight while equipped. Each knight's card at the bottom is going to have two slots for an accessory or powder. Each slot can hold one accessory and one powder, but cannot have two accessories or two powders equipped to the same slot. On the other side, you're going to have an armor slot, which can hold one armor and one cloak. You cannot equip the armor slot with two pieces of armor or two cloaks at one time. And when you get a new piece of equipment, you can either equip it to an open slot, or if all your slots are full, you can replace a piece of equipment. So if you get another armor card and you already have armor equipped, you can choose to discard your previous armor to equip the new one. Moving over to the players, each player is going to be playing a Shovel Knight or a Knight from the Order of No Quarter. Each of these will have its own card listing the name of that knight at the top, along with its four basic stats. The first is the number of hit points that that knight has, or the maximum number of wounds it can take before being defeated. Then you have its attack, defense, and jump stats, and each one of these is going to list a number, which is the number of dice you roll when making that check. Underneath that is going to be that knight's special ability, or passive abilities that it has. For its special ability, it's going to list the number of coins you must spend in order to carry out the ability that is listed on its card. From there, each knight is also going to have two accessory slots and an armor slot, as you already saw. On the back of each knight's card is also its boss variant, so you can play each knight as a boss or as a playable character. From there, let's move over to the enemies. There are two different types. We'll have basic enemies and bosses, which I'm going to cover a little bit later in the video. With the basic enemies, they are going to have their own enemy stat sheet, which is going to list the six different basic enemies included in the game. Each one of these will have its own section that's going to list the name of that enemy, along with its four basic stats, which are the number of hit points that enemy has, its attack and defense, and then when defeated, the number of coins that it will give the knights that defeats it. Underneath that is going to be the type of attack that the enemy performs, whether it is a melee or a ranged attack, and any special abilities that that enemy has. To set up the game, first place the tile track out in the middle of the board. And you can also place out all of the basic enemies that you'll be using for the game and their enemy stat sheet. For player setup, each player will choose a knight that they want to play as and gather that knight's stat card, along with its miniature and three coins. Next, go ahead and choose a starting player, and you can do this in any manner you want to, whether it's the player that played Shovel Knight last, or the player that used the shovel, or any other method you choose. Whoever you've choose, they're going to receive the first player marker, so I'm going to go ahead and have Shovel Knight be the starting player. That player will choose the boss that players will be facing, or collectively you can choose the boss you wish to face. For this game, I'm going to go ahead and go up against King Knight, so you'll go ahead and take his card and place it off to the side, along with his boss miniature, a health track tile, and you can also grab his AI deck and shuffle that up and also place that off to the side. Then you can place out all the rest of the tokens you'll be using for the game, along with the dice out so that all players can reach them. Then you can go ahead and grab the loot card decks, separate them into each individual deck, shuffle those up, and place those off to the side of the table, leaving a little bit of room for a discard of each one of those decks. Go ahead and shuffle up and place out the spawn deck as well. Then go ahead and shuffle up the equipment deck and place that out, and reveal the first three cards of that to create your shop. Next, we're going to set up the tile track. So first off, before doing that, make sure that you have space on the left and right sides of it as you're going to have tiles coming on and going off of the tile track. From there, then go ahead and grab the start tile and place that on the far left side with the arrow pointing up towards the top of the tile. Next, go ahead and grab the boss tiles. Each boss will have their own set of five tiles that you're going to go ahead and shuffle up. And once you have those shuffled up, you'll place them face down on the right side of the board. Then grab the rest of the Planes of Passage tiles, shuffle those up as well, and place those face down on top of the stack you've already created. Then reveal the first three and place those next to the start tile. Make sure again that all of those arrows are pointing up towards the top of the tile track. From there, then you're going to place the mound tiles out, and you're going to do this in a checker pattern. Starting on the far right tile, you'll place one at the top, and there. Then next, we're going to go in the checker pattern, so again, there, and it is okay if they are on spike pits. You will not place any on the start tile. 
Then the players are going to choose their starting position. You can have each player on a separate space or multiple players in one space. It's however you want to do it. You'll start with the first player and then proceed in a clockwise manner around the board. Then you're going to go ahead and spawn enemies. So each space that has the little bone clank skull in it, you're going to spawn an enemy group, starting with the far right tile and then working your way across. So from the top of the tile down, nothing there. So then we have this one here. So we'll reveal a card. So we're going to have a propeller rat and a wisdom in there. Next, we have one here. So we'll have a gold armor and then nothing there. And then one here. And ooh, a hover haft and a liquid samurai. Once you've completed that, then you're ready to start the game with the first player. Shovel Knight Dungeon Duels is a side-scrolling adventure game that is broken down into two parts, the stage itself and then a boss battle at the end. During the stage, this is going to be played over a series of rounds, and each round is broken down into three phases. The hero phase, enemy phase, and end of round phase. This is going to continue going round after round until all the players have moved off the end of the stage. At that point then they'll enter into a boss battle, and I'm going to cover that a little bit later in the video. The first phase in each round is the hero phase. During this phase, each knight is going to get to take a turn, starting with the knight that has the first player marker, and proceeding in a clockwise manner around the board. During each knight's turn, they get to perform three actions from a list of actions. They can do these actions multiple times and in any order that they choose. These actions include moving, jumping, attacking, standing up from being knocked down, using their special action, and buying equipment from Chester. I'm going to take you through each one of these in more detail to show you how they work. The first action I want to look at is a move action. This can allow you to move your knight from its space to an orthogonally adjacent space. No diagonal movement is allowed. There are a couple of exceptions to this. First, you are not allowed to move off of the board in any way, except for at the end of the stage where you can move off of the rightmost tile to the right of that tile. And again, I'll cover that a little bit more later. You're also not allowed to move into a hazard that would kill you, such as spike pits, lava, and a few others, or into a space that has four models in it as that space is considered full. Going back to Shovel Knight, let's look at an example of this. So currently Shovel Knight can choose to move up or to the right. So let's go ahead and say that he moves to the right, and that would conclude his action. Then he can choose to spend other actions in any way he wants to. Looking at one more example of this, in this situation, Shovel Knight can move to the left, he cannot move up or down as that would take him off the board, or he could move to the right. So let's go ahead and say he moves to the right. So anytime a knight moves into a space that contains a treasure mound or coins, they're going to immediately collect those as part of that move action. So I have two coins here, so I'll go ahead and collect those and a treasure mount token that I will reveal. As you can see here, there's a selection of different treasure mount tokens that are going to potentially come up. The first are gems, and they are going to give you a number of coins listed on the token. The other token you're going to run into are treasure chests. In these situations, when you gain a treasure chest, you'll get to choose a loot card of your choice to add to your hand. If you already have three loot cards in your hand, you can choose to discard one of those and draw a new one of your choice. From there, then these tokens will be returned to the supply. A knight that is orthogonally adjacent to a hazard such as spike pits, water, lava, and a few other hazards can choose to perform a jump action to jump across that hazard. In order to accomplish this, you must follow a number of steps that are done in order. First, you must declare the space in which you wish to jump to that is across from the hazard or at a 90 degree angle. So in the examples here, Shovel Knight could jump into this space here, or one of these two spaces. You are not allowed to jump into a space that is full of four models, or into a ha another hazard that will defeat your knight. You are allowed to jump further than just two spaces away, so Shovel Knight could jump all the way to this space with Chester, or I could choose to jump up into this space here, or a few other ones. Once you've chosen your space, you're going to count the number of spaces away that is. So let's go ahead and say that I wish to jump into this space here. I'm going to count away from my knight, one, two, so it's two spaces away. So I need at least two successes to accomplish this jump. From there, I'm going to check my knight's card under his jump stat and gain a number of dice based on that stat. So I will receive two dice as shown on his card. Then I'm going to consult his relic or his loot cards and any accessories or anything he has equipped to see if I gain any bonus dice. At this point, if you have a relic card, you must choose to use that card before you roll if you want to get the plus two successes on that card. But you do not have to. From there, you're going to go ahead and roll your dice. 
From there, there are two different results you're going to get. If you roll at least enough arrows to equal the number of successes you need or more, then you're going to make it to the space that you designated. So in this example, I needed two successes and I rolled two arrows. So I get to move my knight into that space. Now, even if I would have rolled more successes than I needed to, I will only land in the designated space that I designated. I cannot choose to move farther if I rolled more symbols. Any hazard that I jump over that contains coins or mound tokens, I will receive as well. So there is a mound token here. So I am going to receive one loot card of my choice. So I'm going to go ahead and take a relic card and gain that. Then this will be returned to the supply. Now the other type of effect that you might run into is let's say you don't roll enough successes. In that situation, you are going to fall into the first hazard you are jumping over. So if you are jumping over multiple hazards, the first one that you jump over is the one that you would fall into and are defeated. There are three different ways a knight can be defeated. If a knight falls into a hazard that defeats it, if it receives enough hit points equal to its health, or when the tiles slide, if it is on the leftmost tile, then it is defeated. In all three of these situations, the knight model is removed from the board and placed on their board. Then they will lose half of their gold rounded down. If it is because of a tile shift and that gold is returned to the bank, otherwise if it is due to a hazard or their health, they're going to lose half of their coins rounded down and they're going to be placed on that hazard or onto the space that they were defeated in. It is always going to go into the first hazard they are jumping over, so if you're jumping over multiple hazards, it'll be the first one that you jump over. From there then you will gain a loot card of your choice up to the maximum of three loot cards into your hand. If you already have three, you can choose to discard a card beforehand to gain a different one. So going back to our previous example, if Shovel Knight rolls less arrows than he needed, he is going to fall into that spike pit and be defeated. His model would be removed and he would place two coins in that spike pit. And then again, he would gain a loot card. An attack action is going to allow you to attack basic enemies, bosses, and fellow knights. And depending upon your target, this is going to work in two different ways. So I'm going to break this into two sections. First, let's look at basic enemies and bosses as they work the same way, and your goal there is to do damage to defeat that enemy or boss to gain coins. In this example, let's go ahead and look at Shovel Knight, and let's go ahead and say that he wants to target one of these enemies. First, he must be in range of his attack type, so with melee attacks, you must be in the same space as your target. With ranged attacks, you can be in a straight line from your target in orthogonal directions. So with Shovel Knight, let's go ahead and say that he's in this space here. If he has a melee attack, he can target any model in his space. If he had a ranged attack, he could target any model in his space or any model in a straight line. Now walls and full spaces or any space that has four models in it are going to block line of sight. So you will not be able to make an attack on anything past that space if there is a full space. So in this example, Shovel Knight has a melee attack, so he can choose one of these two targets, either the Propeller a Rat or the Bone Clank to target an attack. So let's go ahead and say that he's attacking this Bone Clank here. From there, then he's going to reference his card, and as you can see, his attack value is 3, so he's going to gain 3 dice for that. He'll also check any equipment that he has equipped currently or any loot cards that he wishes to spend for this attack. I don't have any currently, so I'm not going to do that, so I'm simply going to roll the dice. And then I'm going to count up the number of shovels that I rolled. In this example, I did very well with four shovels. From there, then I'm going to reference the enemy's card. So as you can see here, the Bone Clank has two health and no defense. If he had any defense for each defense he had, he would remove one of these shovel successes. Then you will compare that. If you do enough damage to eliminate the enemy, you'll remove him from the board and gain a number of coins as shown on his reference. Bone Clanks are worth two, so I'll gain two coins for that. If you don't do enough damage to your enemy, so let's go ahead and say that I only rolled one shovel, then I would add one wound to the, his base. And then I could try to attack him again if I had any other attack or any other actions to perform. The other type of attack is against a fellow knight. In these situations, you are not trying to do damage, as that would not be chivalrous. Instead, you're trying to push them into an orthogonally adjacent space. So with this example, Shovel Knight is noticed that Plague Knight is doing very well with six coins. He doesn't really like that, so he wants to do something about it. So he's going to go ahead and attack Plague Knight. From there, this is going to work just like any other attack. First, you must meet the requirements of the attack type that you have. With Shovel Knight, he has a melee attack, so he must be in the same space as his target in order to attack his target. If he had a ranged attack, he could be in the same space or in a straight line. Walls and full spaces are going to block line of sight. 
From there, he's going to reference his card and gain a number of dice as shown on there. He's also going to reference any equipment that he has or loot cards that he wishes to use to add additional dice to this roll. Then he'll roll the dice and total up the number of shovels that he rolled. In this situation, Shovel Knight did two shovels, so he has two successes. From there, if he rolls any successes, then it's going to move over to Plague Knight to reference his defense, gaining number of dice based on his defensive value. And again, he's going to reference any equipment he has or loot cards that he wants to roll or add to his roll. He will roll and total up the number of armor symbols that he rolls. Then you'll compare the results. Each armor that he rolls will cancel one success. If there are more successes than, sh than armor that are rolled, then Shovel Knight is successful and will get to push Plague Knight into an orthogonally adjacent space. If Plague Knight rolls equal to or more sh armor than the number of shovels rolled, then Plague Knight is successful and will not be pushed. In this situation, Shovel Knight rolled two shovels, two Plague Knights, one armor. So Pl Shovel Knight did roll more, so he's going to get to push Plague Knight. You can't push a fellow knight off of the board, but you can push them against a border edge. In that situation, if we push Plague Knight down, instead he'd be knocked over and will be placed on his side. Or we could push him to the left, right, or up. Now, if we push him up, he's going to fall into a hazard and be defeated. So that is our best option. So we're going to go ahead and do that. He'll be removed. He'll lose half his coins rounded down to that spike pit. So we'll place those on there where Shovel Knight can potentially jump over there and gain those. And again, he will gain a loot card of his choice up to his hand size. And then he'll get to come back out during his next turn. The one other attack type I want to go over is a cascading attack. So for this example, I'm going to go ahead and use Bounding Soul as this one has a ranged 3 attack, which is a cascading attack on a ranged target. So going through that, again, I have to choose my target. Range attacks allow you to target any model in a straight line orthogonally. So I'm going to go ahead and go after this hover haft here. As there's no wall or full space between them, I have line of sight to my target and range. From there, then I'm going to gather up the number of dice that are shown on the curio card. So I have an attack three. I'll go ahead and roll those dice and total up the number of shovels that I rolled on them. So I have four shovels. Again, I'll compare that to my enemy's armor. The hover halves have one, so they're going to eliminate one of those. And three will go through. So I'll go ahead and place three damage on there. From there, as long as I'm successful in wounding my target, I can continue that cascading attack. I will gain the dice back, except for I will reduce that attack by one value. And again, I can choose my target. So from there, I could go over to this Liquid Samurai and target him. So I think I'm going to go ahead and do that. Ooh, I could try to defeat him. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go ahead and target that hover half and try to defeat him. So from there, again, I'll roll my dice and compare the results. The hover haft has one armor, so it's going to eliminate one of those, but one will get through and I will eliminate him and gain the coins for that. From there, then I can continue that cascading attack on the Liquid Samurai rolling one die. So let's go ahead and see what happens there. And I rolled one success, so that was enough as the Liquid Samurai do not have any armor. If I would have been unsuccessful, or I could have chosen to stop when, before rolling that last die. If you are unsuccessful or you fail to wound your target, you will fall back one space. The one exception to this is with ranged attacks, you will not suffer those ill effects. So there's no reason not to roll that last die unless you don't want to wound your enemy, making them softer for another enemy or another fellow player to come and potentially defeat them. But if Shovel Knight was in the same space as the, that enemy, he would have been pushed one space to the left. A knight that begins his turn knocked down must spend his first action to stand up, or if a knight during their turn gets knocked down, then they must spend their next action to stand up. Each knight also has a special move that they can do by spending one or more coins. For example, as you can see on Shovel Knight's card, he has Strike the Earth, which is going to cost him one coin and will allow him to roll a cascading attack on an enemy in your space. If you cause a wound, you may move one space and choose to continue the cascading attack on a new enemy. So let's look at an example of this. Let's go ahead and say, for example, that we have a propeller knight or rat in here, and then we have shovel knight in this space. Now that he's in that space, he has one action remaining, so let's go ahead and spend a coin and make that cascading attack. So in order to do this, I'm going to gather my three dice again and choose an enemy that I wish to target. So I'm going to go ahead and target the wisdom with my first attack. So let's go ahead and roll. 
and I did terribly. So unfortunately with this, if that happens, then I will fall back one space, which, oh no, he fell into a pike, spike pit. So he's going to lose half of his gold rounded down and is defeated, removing his character from the board, as well as gaining a loot card of his choice. So let's go ahead and take a relic card. But for example, let's go ahead and say that uh, we didn't roll quite that bad and got two successes. So at that point, I have done two wounds to the Wisdom, and then I can continue the attack. I can either choose one of the enemies in there to attack again, or I could move to the next space and attack the Propeller Rat with my Cascading Attack. So let's go ahead and say that I stay in that space. I'm going to target that Wisdom again with two dice this time, and I rolled two successes again, so the Wisdom is defeated, and I will gain three coins for that. And then for my la I'm going to go ahead and move here as part of that cascading attack and roll one die to see if I can get that propeller rat, and I do with one damage. So the propeller rat is defeated, and I will receive one coin for that. At that point, I am done as I am out of dice. I, now, I could have also stopped in this space here after attacking the Wisdom the second time and not chosen to continue on with that cascading attack, because again, if I would have failed... I would have had to fall back one space. A knight that is on the same space as Chester can choose to spend an action and a number of coins to purchase a piece of equipment from Chester's shop. So let's look at an example of this. Let's go ahead and say that Shovel Knight spends an action to purchase a piece of equipment from Chester's shop. He has to spend a number of coins based on the number of equipment cards that he currently has. As he doesn't have any yet, his first purchase will cost him one coin. So I'll spend that and then I'll choose one of the equipment cards that I want. So let's go ahead and take this drop spark, which is an accessory. So then I must immediately equip it to an accessory slot. From there, I'm going to reveal a new card so that I always have a selection of three cards. So that will conclude his action. So now if he had additional actions, he could choose to activate Chester again and purchase another piece of equipment. So let's go through one more example of this. As Silver Knight's second action, let's go ahead and purchase a second piece of equipment. This time, since I already have one, it is going to cost me two coins. So I'll go ahead and discard those. And I think I'll buy this cloak. And this is part of the armor slot. So I'm going to go ahead and place it there. And then again, reveal a new card. Any equipment card that you purchase that is the third equipment piece or beyond is going to cost you three coins from here on out. And a couple other important notes with equipment. Equipment is never discarded when a knight is defeated as it is always going to stay with the knight. And if you purchase a piece of equipment that you already have slotted, you can choose to discard your old equipment to be able to equip your new equipment. And the last thing I want to go over are loot cards, and these can be used in two different ways. You can either use the ability on the back of the card by discarding it and carrying out that ability, or you can use a loot card's front-facing ability. With the front-facing ability, most of the time, unless the card specifies otherwise, it is considered a free action and will not take an action to use. In order to show some examples of this, let's go in through a full turn. So let's go ahead and say that it's Shovel Knight's turn, and he is going to spend his first action to move up into this space. From there, then I'm going to go ahead and use my Heirloom card, and this is going to give me the Scorching Saber. So this is going to be a free action, and it's going to be an attack four. It's also going to allow me to fly two spaces, and I'm going to hit all models in the space that I end in. So I'm going to go ahead and fly two spaces into this space here. I did go over a treasure mound, so I'm going to get to resolve that. So I'm going to gain a, another loot card. So I'm going to go ahead and take a Relic card. And then I'm going to do my attack four, and I'm going to attack all enemies in my space. So I'm going to go roll four dice, and I rolled two successes from there, so I'm going to resolve those against each enemy. So the hover haft is going to take one damage as it has one armor, and the liquid samurai is going to take two damage as it has the one, or has no armor. From there, then this is going to be discarded to the discard pile. And I will continue my turn. I still have two actions remaining, so I'm going to go ahead and attack that Liquid Samurai. So I'm going to gain my dice as normal, so I get three. I got one success. That is going to be enough to eliminate the Liquid Samurai, so I'm going to gain four gold for that. So I'm going to add four gold to my area. 
And then I have one action remaining. So I'm gonna go ahead and do a jump action and I'm gonna to try to go to Chester's space. So that's going to be a jump three. So instead of risking it, I'm gonna go ahead and spend one of my loot cards to use the backside ability. So this is like going to let me discard to gain two successes on my next dice roll. So this is not a free action, so I'm not going to get to do the jump for free as this is not the ability on the back of the card or in the front of the card it is the back of the card. So it's just simply going to add two dice to my next roll or two successes. So I'm gonna go ahead and discard that, and then I'm going to go ahead and make my jump roll as normal, so I'm gonna need at least one jump to make this. And I rolled one success. So that in that situation, I was successful. Now before I complete that jump, my other player over here, the Spectre Knight, didn't really like that and he wants me to fail. So he's gonna go ahead and spend his loot card's ability. This is going to let you discard this to force a rival player to re-roll their last dice roll. So he's gonna go ahead and discard that to use that. And then I'm going to have to re-roll my jump results. And I was still lucky enough to get two jumps, so I was able to reach my designation as I had the two successes from the card and the two arrows here. So I had four successes, which was enough to get me here. At this point, that was my last action for the turn. If I had another loot card to potentially let me do something for free, I could do that, but I do not. So that'll be the end of my turn and it'll move to the next player in clockwise order. Now the one other thing that I forgot to cover, when Shovel Knight moved over these or jumped over these spaces, I do also get to collect these treasure tokens or mound tokens. So let's go ahead and reveal those. So I get one for that and two for that. So I will get three more tokens for having those. And then we're ready to move on. And I wanna show one more example of this. So we're gonna move over to Spectre Knight to go next. Before getting into Spectre Knight's turn, I do also wanna cover what happens when a knight starts the turn and they've been defeated. So let's go ahead and say for whatever reason that Spectre Knight had been defeated in some way. And so now we're ready to move into Spectre Knight's turn. So when a knight has been defeated in a previous turn, at the beginning of their turn, they're going to choose a space on the leftmost space to go. Now you cannot choose a hazard space or a space that is full or has four models in it. But other than that, you will be able to choose a space. Now, if all of the leftmost spaces are full or have hazards on them, then you'll move over to the next space that is the leftmost space, and you'll continue doing this until there's a valid space to go. With this being a starting tile, we have plenty of spaces to choose from, so I'm gonna go ahead and place Spectre Knight here. From there, then we're ready to move into Spectre Knight's turn, where you're gonna to get to take the three actions with Spectre Knight as normal. So first off, let's go ahead and take a look at Spe Spectre Knight's special ability. So we're gonna go ahead and spend the two coins as shown on his card, and then we're gonna carry out the action on that card. So with this, it, Spectre Knight must move one space. So we're gonna go ahead and move Spectre Knight one space, and then attack a model in that space. So we must meet those conditions first before being able to carry this out. And then if we wound that model, then we can repeat this action. Unfortunately, there aren't any other models that Spectre Knight's gonna be able to move directly into. So it's pretty much just going to be able to this one attack just so that I could move in and save that extra action. So now I'm gonna go ahead and roll Spectre Knight's dice. He's gonna get four dice for this. And let's see what we get here. And we did terrible. I was I was blocking armor for days. Let's go ahead and say, for the sake of this example though, that Spectre Knights rolled much better. So let's go ahead and say that we got this result here. So again, with the propeller, uh, the hover haft, it does have one armor, so it's gonna eliminate one, but we ended up doing four more damage and it already had taken a wound as well, so it has been defeated. So we'll go ahead and remove that. And then with the hover half, it's worth four gold. So I'm just going to change in this for that. All right, from there, then uh, Spectre Knight has two actions remaining. So I'm gonna go ahead and try to do a jump action. I'm gonna go ahead and try to jump into this space here. So with the Spectre Knight, I get two dice and I need a jump of two and I got it. So I'm gonna go ahead and move in here. And then as my last action, I will, hmm. I think I'm just going to simply move into this space here. And then I get five more gold for that. So that was very successful for Spectre Knight. And that is the end of his turn. So from here, then we move over to the next Knight to go in clockwise order. 
All right, so at this point, I went ahead and took Plague Knight's turn off camera. So we're ready to move into the next phase of the round, which is the enemy phase. So this is going to have a specific order in which it's done. So first off, all of the enemies are going to move, starting with the Liquid Samurai and working your way through this chart, as you can see here. So before doing that, we do have the Hover Half that has a special ability, which says that it is going to push heroes in the row back one space before the enemy phase. So poor Spectre Knight is going to be pushed one space to the left. From there, then we're gonna go ahead and resolve the rest of this. So each one of our enemies is going to move, starting with the hover half. He's gonna move forward one space to get him into contact with the closest knight. Then we're going to work our way down from there. So next is going to be the gold armor that's gonna move, and he is tied for distance between these two knights as he's a melee enemy. So then we're going to compare the knight's gold, and unfortunately Shovel Knight has more gold at this point, so the gold armor is going to move up and face him. Then the propeller rat is going to move, and the wisdom will stay here as he already has range to the plague knight. Then you're going to resolve each enemy's attack if it is in the same space as a uh, knight. If it is a melee enemy, if it's a ranged enemy, it has a range as far as it can see in a straight line towards that knight. And then you're going to resolve all enemies' attacks at once. So if you have multiple enemies attacking a fellow knight, then they have to resolve all of that damage in one go. So for that example, let's go ahead and work our way down. So we have the hover half attacking Spectre Knight first. The hover half does two damage. It does not roll dice. And so then Plague Knight is going to get to roll its defense of two. So let's see if we can defend against this. And that's a crack, and we do not. So we are going to take two damage. So we'll place two health tokens on our space. And we are pushed one space to the left, but unfortunately we are already as far as we can go. So then we are going to be knocked down. Next, the gold armor is going to go against Shovel Knight. So Shovel Knight will also roll his defense of two, and so the gold armor does two on his melee attack. And unfortunately, Shovel Knight doesn't do any better and will also take two wounds from that and be pushed one space to the left. Then the Wisdom is going to attack Plague Knight. So Plague Knight only gets one defense and the Wisdom does two damage. Plague Knight also takes two hits and is pushed. So none of our heroes or none of our knights have done very well this turn. Then let's go ahead and show one more example of this. So let's go ahead and say instead that we had this situation where both the Propeller Rat and the gold armor was in Shovel Knight's space. When he rolls his defense, he must defend against both the gold armor's two damage and the plague rat's one damage, so he would have three damage coming his way instead that he would have to roll his defense for. And this time he stopped one, so he would take the two and again be pushed to the left. Once you've resolved all of that, then the enemy's phase has come to an end, and you're ready to move into the final phase, which is the end of round phase. And the final phase in the round is the end of round phase, and this phase has six steps that are going to be done in order. The first step is that the leftmost tile is going to slide off of the board. Any models that are on there or knights are going to instantly be defeated. Any tokens or coins that are on there will be returned back to the supply. So let's go ahead and resolve this. So first off, Spectre Knight has been defeated as Spectre Knight is on the leftmost tile that is going to be moved off. So his model will be moved over to his playing area. You will also remove all of his health and he'll lose coins rounded down, so he will never lose the last coin. Then he gets to choose a card, a loot card to gain. So I, he is going to take a curio card, as this one can be discarded to force a rival player to re-roll their last dice roll. And he notices that Shovel Knight has got a lot of coins, so this might come in handy when Shovel Knight gets a really good roll. So I'm going to go ahead and hold on to that. From there, then, the Hover Haft will be defeated as well and his health will be returned to the supply, and nobody will be granted the coins from that. Then the start tile will be moved over. The tiles are going to slide down to the left, defeated, and you'll flip over a new tile and place that on the board. You want to make sure that the arrow is pointing up, and then you'll also add mound tokens again in the checker pattern, so you'll have two mound tokens here. And then if that tile has any spawn points on it, you must resolve those. So let's go ahead and start with the one at the top. And so we have a Wisdom there. And then the one down here is going to ooh, have another Hover Haft and Liquid Samurai. So nasty. 
Final step in the round is that the player with the first player token is going to be passed to the next player to the left. So Spectre Knight will be the first knight to start the next round. And at this point, then the round is over and you can begin a new round. And this is going to continue until you will run out of tiles, at which point then the players are able to move off of the board and go ahead and face the boss. So I'm going to show you that next. At this point, the final tile has been placed onto the tile track. From this point on until the stage is completely done, any knights can move off of this tile and be safe for the remainder of the rounds, where none of the other players can affect them and they cannot lose any more coins until the boss battle begins. So let me show you one more quick example of this and I'll also be able to talk about these tiles. So each boss is going to have their own special set of five tiles that will have their own special rules. With King Knight, his are going to have the walls and these are going to be represented by these red lines on the tiles as you can see. Unless you have an equipment piece or other ability, you are not allowed to move through those spaces. So right now with Plague Knight, Plague Knight is in a little bit of a trouble as he is completely boxed in. But he does have a cloak that lets him move through walls, so that is okay. He can move through and everything's good. And each boss is going to again have their own special tiles, which I'm going to cover in a separate video going over the special rules for each boss and how they work. So let's go ahead and take a look at one quick example of this so that you can see how this works. So Spectre Knight, it is going to be Spectre Knight's turn to start the round. So Spectre Knight has her, his three actions. He's going to move forward one. He will go ahead and attack that hover haft. Why not? And he also gets to resolve this treasure mound. So he's going to get three coins for that. So those will be added to his area. And then let's go ahead and attack the hover haft. And a little bit better this time, he rolled four successes. The hover haft has one defense, so he's going to take and add three wounds there. And as his last action, he's going to go ahead and move off. He has a lot of coins, so he doesn't want to risk that. So he's going to move off, and he'll be placed over here, and he will be safe for the rest of the rounds until the boss comes up. Now, the one other thing I want to point out is even after the last tile has been placed on the board, the rounds are going to continue round after round. Each round, the final tile, the leftmost tile will drop off, and the rest of the tiles will slide over. You will not add any new tiles, but the playing area is going to continue to get smaller and smaller for players to try to get off and go ahead and face the boss. Before getting into the boss battle setup, I want to go over the boss's stat card and AI deck. So each boss is going to have their own stat card, which is going to list the name of that boss in the top, along with its three stats, which include its health, attack, and defense. Each boss also has an end of round attack that they'll perform at the end of the round. And at the bottom of the card is the boss's HP track, which will have a tracker placed on it and will track the boss's current number of hit points. Each boss is also going to have a deck of eight AI cards, and each of these cards is going to list the name of the attack on it, along with the, play, the space the boss will move to, and any red spaces the boss will attack, any white spaces the boss will not attack. On the King Knight's cards, you're also going to see blue lines, which will have no effect in the game. To set up the boss battle, go ahead and remove all the stage tiles from the tile track, and then place the boss board on the, on the track. The orientation of the board does not matter, you can change it any way you want to. From there, then you're going to place the boss that you selected on the second space on the side here. Go ahead and shuffle up his deck of AI cards and place that off to the side, as well as his stat card. Go ahead and place the health tracker on the bottom on his health. So with the King Knight, he has a health of 15. From there, then starting with the player that has the first player marker, each player will place their figure in one of the four spaces. Again, you can have multiple figures in the same space. So Shovel Knight's going to go ahead and go first, and Shovel Knight's going to go here. From there, then we're ready to move into the round. So unlike in the stage round, the boss round works a little bit differently. After each player takes their turn, you're going to reveal and resolve a boss AI card. And then at the end of the round, once all three players have gone, or after all players have gone, instead of revealing a boss AI card, you're going to resolve the boss's special ability. So let's go ahead and show some examples of this. So first off, we're going to go ahead and start with Shovel Knight as he is the first player. So he starts with his three actions. So he's going to take his first action to move forward, second action to move forward again. And his third action, he's going to attack King Knight as he does have the drop spark, which lets him attack at one range. So he, does, he can attack the King Knight at range one. So he's going to gather up his dice. He gets three dice and he's going to attack King Knight. And this works just like when attacking other enemies. So we're going to count up the number of shovels, and he did very well with five hits. Then King Knight is going to subtract his defense from that, 
So he takes two successes away, and so Shovel Knight does three damage to him. So he's going to reduce his health track by three, so that'll bring him down to 12. And then for each damage that Shovel Knight does, he gains two coins for that. So Shovel Knight has picked up six coins for those three wounds. From there, now Shovel Knight has completed all of his actions, so then we have to reveal and resolve a King Knight AI card. So again, with these, you're going to orientate it so that the text is pointing up towards the top of the tile, and then the card is going to show where King Knight is going to move. So as you can see here, King Knight will move into this space here, and then every red space, King Knight is going to attack with two attack, uh, with his attack stat. So with this chart, Shovel Knight has been hit, and the other two knights are safe at this point as they are in a white space, so King Knight will not attack that. So Shovel Knight is going to take an attack of two. He gets to roll his defense of two as well, so let's see if he can defend against it. He did not, so for each point of damage he takes, he has to drop a coin in that space, and then he is also going to be pushed one space to the left. Again, if you are pushed off of the board, you will not be able to be pushed off the board, but you will be knocked down instead. So if Shovel Knight was here and was attacked, he would be pushed and knocked down. So instead, he was there. The other important thing that I want to point out is if you are knocked down, so let's say that Shovel Knight was here and knocked down, during his next turn, if he, when he stands up, any coins that are in his space are immediately collected by him. So he was not, though, so let's go ahead and place the, this back here. From there, then it would move over to the next player to go. So Specter Knight would be the first one or the next one to go in order. So let's go ahead and skip through Specter Knight's turn and say that let's go ahead and reveal the card. So this one again will have us move King Knight and attack all of these spaces. So now Specter Knight and Plague Knight would take hits, so they would have to resolve their stuff. And then let's go ahead and say that Plague Knight went and took care of his stuff. So then at the end of his turn, since he is the last player in this round, instead of resolving an AI card, we're going to resolve King Knight's special ability, which is you're going to move King Knight to the space with the winning hero. So that's whoever has the most coins. So right now that is Shovel Knight. He is going to knock that player down. And then he's going to attack them. So again, he would attack Shovel Knight for two damage. So Shovel Knight, oh, I also forgot to add those two damage tokens to Shovel Knight. And Shovel Knight defends against it, though. He rolls three armor, so no damage there. If he would have taken damage, again, you would have to add a wound token. You'd also drop one coin, and again, he would have been pushed. But again, he didn't take any damage at this point, so he is not pushed, and he doesn't take any additional damage. This is going to continue until one of two things happens. First off, if you ever run out of the AI card deck, so let's go ahead and say that all of the cards have been used. At this point, when you have to draw another card, instead of shuffling that deck, you're simply going to flip it back over. So those players that have kept track of those cards and what order they're in could potentially have an advantage as they know which cards are going to come up next. This is going to happen three times. If the boss is not defeated by the time his AI deck runs out, completely for the third time, then the game is over and the players will determine who is the winner. The player that has the most coins will be the winner. And with the boss, if he is defeated, the same thing is going to happen. The players will calculate who has the most coins by adding up all their coins and any heirlooms that they have as well, as each heirloom will give the player five coins. Now, one other important thing that I want to point out is that the last hit point that the boss takes is worth five coins instead of two. So let's go ahead and drop it down here. We'll go ahead and say that the boss has one hit point left and Specter Knight is in his space and attacks. So let's go ahead and resolve that real quick. And Specter Knight rolls three hits, so just enough as, play, as uh, King Knight takes two for his defense. One goes through. So Specter Knight did the last point of damage and so King Knight has been defeated. He will receive five gold coins for that last point of damage. And then again, the players will total up their coins and whoever has the most will be the winner of the game. Well, I hope you found this video helpful. If you have any questions or comments, please leave those in the comment section below and I'll do my best to answer them. And also keep in mind that I will have an additional video coming out covering each one of the bosses. So if you have specific questions about them, also leave the, your questions in the comments below and I'll make sure to address those during the next video that I put out for those. And in that one, again, I will cover all of the bosses that are included in the game. As always, thank you so much for taking the time to watch my videos and leave me feedback on them. I do really appreciate and take into account everything you say to make the best possible videos. Until next time, I'll see you later.